Hi, I'm Bay Gaddafi, and this is Bible Study Verse by Verse. We're studying through a book of the Bible a verse at a time. This series of lessons is in the New Testament on the Gospel of John. If you'd find your Bible and open it to John in the New Testament, we'll begin in just a moment. John is the Bible book we're studying. This is lesson number eight, and we're beginning with John chapter one and verse 16. If you'd like to open your Bible there, we'll begin in a moment. We have a free offer of a written Bible study for you <clears throat> entitled Baptism and Salvation. You can request a copy by emailing me at the address shown at the end of the lesson. Let's begin by reading John chapter one, verse 16 and 17. And of his fullness have we all received. Grace for grace. Grace and truth, <clears throat> I'm sorry, for, for, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing on your word, Lord. Thank you for um, giving it to us. Thank you that we can base our lives upon it, that we can read it and know that you wrote it and that uh, we can apply it to our lives, we can understand it, we can uh, take it in uh, to our being and make it the most important thing for us. Lord, uh, help us as we study this to understand it. Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy that you've extended to us through your Son, the Lord Jesus, and we ask for your Holy Spirit now to open our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, we've gotten to this point in uh, John chapter 1, <clears throat> and it seems like, almost like, uh, that it's hard to follow what John is writing because it seems to be disjointed. And um, <clears throat> it seems to be disjointed that each verse doesn't flow from the next verse or doesn't lead into the following verse. And um, if you try to read it um, uh, like that, um, what you come away with is the, is the sense that it's, it's disjointed. But I want you to turn to uh, John chapter 20 and verse 31. John chapter 20, verse 31. <clears throat> the Apostle John gives us his reason for writing this book. And it, it, it makes chapter 1 and the verses and the way that they're arranged make sense when you understand what John is trying to do. <clears throat> John says there, but these are written, in other words, these things that are written in this book that he wrote, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So the things that he wrote in this book are for the purpose that we might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, he's the Son of God, and that when we believe that, we will have life, eternal life, through his name. That's the purpose of it. So <clears throat> now John chapter 1 makes sense. <clears throat> his purpose is to show who Jesus is. And he's not so much concerned about a narrative that flows, uh, that, that, that has a flow to it. It's like um, he's boasting about the Lord Jesus. Each one of these is a boast about the Lord Jesus. Um, well, let's just run down this chapter. It, it'll probably be a good review. In the beginning was the Word. That's about Jesus. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning, beginning about, was in the beginning with God. All those are about Jesus. Everything was made by Him. He made everything. There was nothing that wasn't made by Him. He has life within Himself, verse 4. That life is the light of men. The light shined in darkness. Men didn't get it. Verse 6, uh, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And that's probably one of the only verses in this whole section that doesn't directly relate to the Lord Jesus. But seven does, that John came as a witness to the light. He, he was a witness to the Lord Jesus that we might believe through him. Uh, he wasn't that light, but he was a witness of the light. Jesus is the true light that lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own. All these have as the subject... Uh, of the Lord Jesus, and it's like a, 
uh, um, each one is an explosion of meaning about who Jesus is. Um, he came unto his own, his own didn't receive him, but if you receive him, you have power to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name, which are born of God, um, not of the will of man, not of the will of flesh, um, um, not, but of God. And the Word is made flesh then in 14, and He dwells among us, and uh, full of grace and truth. John bore witness and cried and said, This is He of whom I spake is coming um, after me, is preferred before me, because He was before me. All, all of this has to do with Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. This is who He is, and this is an, uh, a, a boast in Christ is what it is. And then 16 continues that boast. Of his fullness have we all received in grace for grace. So um, this is another, um, what would you call it? It's a, um, um, a boast about who Jesus is. The, they all might appear to be disjointed, but they all have this one subject. They're all about the Lord Jesus. They're all about who he is. He's preferred, preferred before John because he was before John. I mean, he is light. He is, uh, he is life. He is the creator. He is eternal. Uh, if you receive him, you receive life. Um, he, he is glorious and full of grace and full of truth. Um, and of his fullness, we've received. So uh, this is a testimony. Um, we can take it like, all right, John's saying... I know this because I've received this of him. I've received of his fullness. It's come to me that and, and, and to the rest of the, the apostles. His fullness has come to me. But also it's come to us in this way. We receive of the fullness of the Lord Jesus um, in our lives. So let's look at some examples of this. Uh, turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15 um, Uh, verses 1 uh, through 5. <clears throat> I'm the vine. This is Jesus talking. I'm the true vine. I'm the only vine. <laughs> this is an agriculture example. It's a metaphor. He's not really a vine. He's uh, these people who are familiar with agriculture, and we are a little familiar with it, no matter if you ever lived on a farm or not. You know that um, grapes come from a vine. And... Um, that's what Jesus is saying. I'm that vine and my father is the husbandman or the gardener. So um, God is the one who's interested in the progress of the vine. He's interested in the vine producing fruit for him. Every branch, that's us, in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. So if your life is fruitless for God, uh, there's a very possibility that you're not correctly connected to the Lord Jesus and you're going to be taken away. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it or trims it and so that it'll bring forth more fruit. So God is interested in fruit. He wants your life to produce spiritual fruit from him. He wants you to have the fruits of the Spirit in your life. He wants you to have the gifts that the Spirit brings with him when he gives you repentance and faith. And he wants you to serve his church he wants you to be evangelistic. All these things are a product of that branch being connected to that vine uh, to receive what it needs to live. Of his fullness we have all received. Here's how we receive his fullness. We're connected to him. We're connected to him through the word of God. When God speaks, we listen. I mean, you can't overemphasize this enough. Are you in the Word of God? Are you reading the Word of God? Is this your food? Jesus said, um, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Do you live by the words that proceed out of the mouth of God? Do you have spiritual life within you that needs to be fed the Word of God? Um, if the answer is, well, not so much, I can probably go... Uh, a very, very, very long time, more than 40 days, <laughs> without hearing anything from God and be perfectly fine. There's something very wrong with uh, one who claims to be a Christian and can live without God's Word. We need His Word. We need that connection to the Lord Jesus 
in order for us to produce fruit. God's interested in fruit. <clears throat> he wants the vine and the branches to produce fruit. And he's going to purge it that it brings forth more fruit. Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. How do you get clean in the world? How do you live in the world that's full of sin and fallenness and yet remain pure? Like Jesus did. That was part of his glory from that last lesson, uh, from lesson seven. That was his glory that he was in the world and, and was not of the world. You do it through the application of the word of God into your life. You have to take it in. You have to have that nourishment. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. I mean, there's a um, perfect example of our need for connection to the Lord Jesus. Of his fullness, we have all received. If you're not connected to him, the Bible says you can do nothing. What, what you do is going to be nothing for God. But didn't I do this and didn't I do that? Yeah, but you weren't connected to the Lord Jesus. Doesn't count. God's not impressed. He's impressed with his son. And when we are in his son, that impresses him. When we're connected to the son, that's impressive to God. When we don't have that connection, it's not. Very simply, he's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the father but through him. Are you connected to the son? Are you in his word? Those two things are inseparable. You have to be in the word to have a connection with the son. And of his fullness we receive because of our connection to him. He's the vine, we're the branches. We can't bring forth fruit without that connection to the vine. All right, so <clears throat> turn to another place, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 <clears throat> and verse 18 in chapter 1 says, And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, that's Jesus, Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, he's the one that rose up from the dead first, never to die again, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He is preeminent for us. He is our head. So a body can live without a hand or a foot or an arm or a leg, but it cannot live without a head. We have to have a connection to our head. Um, he is the beginning. He is the firstborn. He is preeminent. Um, uh, we have received from him uh, grace and truth. Um, he is our connection with God. He is the, uh, the, the channel through which grace flows into our lives. He gives us our direction. He gives us our sustenance that we need to live. Uh, he provides for us um, everything we need uh, comes from the Lord Jesus. He is preeminent in our lives. He's the firstborn from the dead. We're going to rise up from the dead at the resurrection because he rose up from the dead. And he is alive forever with God. He is full of grace and truth. And look at chapter 2 of Colossians and um, verse 19. It says, And not holding the head from which all the body and by joints and bands have nourishment. And this is old King James language. Um, uh, in other words, you have to understand where your instructions come from. You have to understand how the life of God flows down to you. It comes from the head, the Lord Jesus, the whole body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. All right, let me read it in a different place in a more modern version. Colossians chapter 1, or rather Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse 19. <clears throat> he has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. So that connection that we have with the Lord Jesus is the thing that causes growth. It causes life. Your life is in Jesus. Um, we are seated together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're not sitting there by yourself. You're sitting there in Christ because you're connected to Him. His 
uh, His life is yours. God pours out His grace to you through Christ. We are recipients of everything that God has uh, for us because um, God has given us His fullness in Christ Jesus. The, the whole body, um, by joints and bands, having the nourishment it needs, ministers um, to each other. It's knit together with the increase of God. God is the one who does this. Of His fullness we have all received. Um, and then uh, turn back to John uh, chapter 1. It says, <clears throat> and grace for grace. I mean, this is a hard concept to understand. I mean, it's just kind of a statement that's out there. Um, it's, it's a superlative. It means grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. When God's grace is funneled down to you and channeled to you through the Lord Jesus, and you embrace that grace and you use that grace and you love that grace and you seek after that grace, um, more grace is added to you. <clears throat> the scripture says in 1 Corinthians, uh, covet earnestly the best gifts, desire to prophesy, desire to build up the other believers, desire to use your gift um, for the benefit of, God, of Christ's body. It's, it's um, grace then is added upon grace. Are you using the grace that God has given you? Are you aware that God has given you grace? Um, do you want more of that grace? Um, it's the, uh, grace is the, uh, you know, simple version, the unmerited favor of God in your life. It's the flow, uh, like Colossians is talking about, uh, like uh, uh, John is talking about the vine and the branches and the head and the body. It's the flow of life. Uh, from God through the Lord Jesus Christ to you. It's what keeps us alive. It's, it's God's influence on every area of our life. I mean, how do you have your mental capacity? Why aren't you a blithering idiot in an insane asylum? It's because God's grace has flowed to you. How are you able to live and move and have your being? It's because God's grace uh, has flowed to you and kept you alive and gives you your mental capacities and gives you your physical capacities. How, are you serving Him with those things and then getting more grace upon that? Grace for grace, grace upon grace, superlative grace. That's what this is talking about. Um, His fullness we have received. It comes to us from God through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is His grace upon more grace upon more grace in our lives. Um, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 30 says, But of him, of God, how did you get to be saved? It's God. God did it. Of him, of God, are you in Christ Jesus, who Christ, by God or of God, is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Boy, you can wrap your mind around these ideas. Understand who Christ is for us. Of His fullness we have all received. He is our wisdom. You want to be wise? Uh, wisdom begins with the fear of God. It begins to understand who God is. And you understand God, who God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is uh, our mediator between God and man. He is our wisdom. He is our righteousness. If you're like Him, you're righteous. When you're saved, your sins are forgiven, but you also get the righteousness of Christ. And God sets about in your life to make you holy, sanctify you, make you holy, set you apart for Himself. He is our sanctification. Um, God at work in your life through the rough things that He allows to come to you, James chapter 1, Romans chapter 5, those things are not pleasant, but it's God working those things in you to prove your faith to show you real, to give you patience, to make you mature, to make you grow up in, into Christ. And redemption, He is our redemption. How did you get to God? You came through the redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ. He purchased us by the death of His Son. You belong to Him. Can any man take you out of His hand? Of course not. When, when Christ has saved you, you're secure forever because it wasn't you that did it. It's not of blood, it's not of the will of the man, it's not of the will of flesh, 
but you're born of God. God redeemed us through the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, Christ, in God, Christ has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That is, that according as it is written, he that glories in this glory has that idea of a boast. You want to make a boast? Don't boast in yourself. Don't boast in what you've done. Don't boast in how smart you are, how you were the one that came to Christ because you are smarter than the other people. Glory, glory, boast in the Lord Jesus Christ. My boast is in the Lord. That's acceptable to God. That glorifies God. That exalts the Lord Jesus. That puts him up where he belongs to be honored and glorified. Our sufficiency is in him. Our salvation is in Him. Our sanctification is in Him. Our wisdom is in Him. Our righteousness is in Him. All these things are what the Lord Jesus is to us. That's why John can say <clears throat> in John chapter 1, of His fullness have we all received. Grace for grace. Grace upon grace. Superlative grace. Grace uh, that... Uh, builds upon each other. As God gives you grace and you rely more on Him, He gives you more grace and more testings and more trials and more grace. <laughs> grace for grace. That's what it's talking about. Okay, uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. This has that same idea of headship in it. <clears throat> 5.23 of Ephesians, For the husband is the head of the wife, and uh, this is a, an analogy, a metaphor. The husband's the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Christ is our head. He saves us. Our salvation is in him. He gives us, um, he gives us life because we are connected to him. He is our salvation. He gives us direction. He, uh, everything that functions in the body of Christ functions because it's connected to the head. And then he uses the husband-wife relationship um, to show how a husband should love his wife and be the savior of her body. All right. So turn back to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 <clears throat> in verse 17. Again, this seems to be disjointed. You know, why is he talking about the fullness and now he's talking about the law? Before that, he was talking about John in verse 15. And then he was talking about the word being made flesh. I mean, these things don't seem to fit together, but they do if you understand that each of these is a boast of the Lord Jesus. It's glorying in the Lord Jesus. Here's another glory of the Lord Jesus in verse 17 of John chapter 1. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, is John uh, speaking ill of the law? Is he dissing the law? Is he saying, boy, there sure is something wrong with the law. It, it was given by Moses, you know, don't pay attention to it. You know, don't, um, don't listen to it. Um, he's not saying that at all. It is a comparison of how much better Christ is than the law that was given by Moses. Let's look at some verses. Uh, Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Okay, so here's the question. You know, what's wrong with the law? You know, is it bad to keep the law? Is it bad to look at the law? Is it bad to compare your life to God's law? Is the law sin? His answer is, God forbid. No, I had not known sin, but by the law. The law is, brings the knowledge of sin. The law shows you your sin. The law has a purpose, a godly purpose in our lives. For I had not known lust, Paul says, except the law had said, you shall not covet. What good is the law? Well, it's of a lot of good. The law is a, is a partner in the gospel message. The law prepares the soul to hear the truth of the good news. The law is the bad news of which the gospel is the good news. The law shows you your sin. I had not known sin, but by the law. How do, how do you know sin? Well, you, you compare yourself to God's law. This is the way you have to behave. This is the way you do behave. I'm in trouble because I've broken God's law and the wages of sin is death. I'm going to earn death because of, of what I've done. I'm going to be paid off by God. I have a eternal death. One sin 
means death. I've done thousands and hundreds of thousands of sins. And if I got what I deserved, I'd be dead forever because the law shows me this. Um, it shows me my sin. That's the purpose of the law. It shows us our sin. Is the law sin? No, God forbid. The law is good. Uh, look at verse 12 in Romans chapter 7. What? Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy, just, and good. Oh, there's a high view of the law here. What is the law? The law is holy. The law is just. The law is good. That's the, what God says about it in the New Testament, about the Old Testament law. Holy, just, and good. And then um, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The law has a spiritual element to it. <clears throat> uh, the law says don't murder. Uh, the um, sixth commandment. Don't kill anybody. Don't stab them, don't shoot them, don't club them over the head. That means more than that. Jesus said in John, uh, Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said, you know, don't murder. I'm telling you, this is what it means. This is the spiritual meaning of it. Don't hate someone in your heart. Don't hold bitterness and anger against someone in your heart. When you have that heart attitude toward another person, you've murdered them. Oh, I know you didn't pull the trigger, but you've murdered them nonetheless. That's how God looks at it. That's the spirituality of the law. The law in the Old Testament is holy. It's just. It's good. Is there anything wrong with the law? And he says, no. The law is meant to show us our sin. <clears throat> um, sin that it might appear sinful, verse 13 says, working death in me by that which is good. Sin might be, by the commandment, might, be, might become exceedingly sinful. The commandment, the law, brings sin to a head. A person who's going to get saved needs to see the law. They need to see their sin. They need to be sinners to come to God. Jesus came for sinners, didn't come for righteous people. Righteous people look at the law and they say, hey, I've done all that. Uh, you know you, you know what the law says. Jesus said to the rich young, young ruler, you know, don't cheat anybody, don't steal, uh, honor your father and mother, you know, do all these things, don't 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 do don't break the law and he said oh I've kept all those things since I was youth Jesus puts his finger on the guy's sin and says okay go sell everything that you have your you covet your possessions your wealth is your God now go sell all that come follow me make God your true God and not this idol that you have put in the place of God in your heart that's what the law does it puts its finger on our sin. If you want to be a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, be an expert in the law. In the spiritual application of the law to the hearts of men. That's what, what is necessary in a partnership between the law and the gospel to bring people to Christ. Because when they see their sin, they're going to cry out for a Savior. How can I get rid of this? It's like Christian with the with uh, in Pilgrim's Progress with a pack of sin on his back. He's weighted down by the sin. He hates it. He can't carry it. He wants it off his back. That's what sin is. And when you come to the cross, the sin drops away. That's what we need. That's why we need to be experts in the law. We need to know how to present the law to people to show them their sin. Like Jesus did. People came to him. What's the greatest commandment? What, 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 how do you read it? What does it say? Well, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. You've said, well, go and do that, and you'll live. And then the guy says, well, wait a minute, who's my neighbor? He wants to justify himself. And Jesus tells him of the Good Samaritan. <laughs> Puts his finger right on his sin. You hate people. You, will, you wouldn't be like that Samaritan. You hate Samaritans. You wouldn't even go there. You'd pass by on the other side. Oh, man, there's... Somebody, I'm not going to help them. The Samaritan, the one that's hated by the Jews, was a good neighbor. Showed love to the person that was in deep trouble, about to die. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, <clears throat> we're going to look at a couple places. Verse 6 in Galatians 3. Um, 
says, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So faith is the thing that gets you righteousness before God. It's not keeping the law. <clears throat> the law is holy, just, and good. The law is spiritual. Is the law sin? God forbid. It's not sin. It's necessary. We need to understand the law. <clears throat> but we come to God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our righteousness. And look in Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should after, afterward be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster. Other versions call it a tutor, <clears throat> uh, an instructor. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might just be justified by faith. What does the law do? Well, it shuts you up to the fact that you're a sinner. It shuts you up to the fact that you need a deliverer. You need someone who will take you out of the natural consequences of your sin and deliver you from that and bring you out of it. it it's being kept under the law. That's what the law does. The law is holy and just and good. <clears throat> it's, um, it's good for us to understand the law. It brings us to Christ. That's what it does. Um, but after, verse 25 of Galatians uh, 3, But after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for you are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So the, the law precedes the gospel. The law is necessary for the gospel. There's nothing wrong with the, the, the law of Moses. Moses gave it, but it came from God. All Moses did was tell you what God said. He was just a, a, an, a, an arbitrator, a mediator. Uh, he mediated the, the Old Covenant. This is what God says you have to do. This is how you have to live. And uh, by the way, <laughs> you can't do it, so we have to have a whole sacrificial system set in place to atone for the sins that you commit because you can't keep the law. We have to have bloody sacrifices day after day after day after day. Once a year, the high priest took blood for himself, then blood for the people to atone for sins. And it never could get the job done. Uh, back to John chapter 1, verse 17. For the law was given by Moses. Is anything wrong with the law? No. Spiritual, just, good. <clears throat> it's a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But there's something better than that. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law will kill you. It shows you your sin. Jesus Christ brings grace into your life. He brings truth into your life. He grants you <clears throat> the fullness of God. He gives you the nourishment that you need to live before God. He's the vine. We're the branches. We can't bear fruit without Him. He's the head. We're the body. We can't live without Him. He gives us our instructions. He gives us our marching orders. It's through Christ Jesus that grace and truth came into the world. It's a boast about Jesus. Moses gave you this, but Jesus gives you something that's much, much better than that. There's nothing wrong with the law. It has its purpose. Schoolmaster, bring you to Christ. Spiritual, just, and good. But Christ gives you life. In him was life, John chapter 1 says. And that life, verse 4, and the life was the light of men. Are you in Christ? Has that life come to you? Has light come? come into your life. Do you understand the Bible when you read it? Do you make the Bible your food, your spiritual food? Is it like Jesus said, um, every man shall not live by, word, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Is that true for you? In him is the fullness, and we've all received it. Grace for grace, grace on top of grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Okay, one more verse, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, in verse 1, it says, <clears throat> Then verily the first covenant, the one that Moses gave, had also ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. So Moses, mediator of the, of the old covenant, there was divine services, things you needed to do, the way things were supposed to work. There was a, uh, a sanctuary, a worldly sanctuary, a tent, in the wilderness, a tabernacle made with hands, made out of skin, you know, a rectangle and then a square, and then inside the square was 
two rooms and then in, in, in the innermost room was where the ark was and where God dwelt and then they it, when they got to Jerusalem and they finally built, built a temple um, and um, uh, and placed you know Solomon's temple and then Herod's temple after the destruction of Solomon's temple that was the place that God was supposed to dwell and that was Moses's law it was supposed to work like that but look at verse 11 in John I'm sorry, in Hebrews chapter 9. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, Moses gave the law. That law prescribed how the tabernacle was supposed to be set up. Now there's a tabernacle that's better than the one that Moses gave. It, was, it Verse 11 says it's not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. It's not a building on earth. It's a, it's a tabernacle in heaven. And in that tabernacle, neither by the blood of bulls and goats or calves, verse 12 of Hebrews 9, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So the tabernacle that was on earth and the temple that was on earth, those things were only figures of what was in heaven. And that heavenly tabernacle and temple, Jesus, when he died, took his blood there and placed it there, and he accomplished what all those other things on earth could not do. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He accomplished what the law of Moses could not do. 13 says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling to the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, it only cleaned up your flesh, it only cleaned you up on the outside, it didn't actually forgive your sins. It only pointed to what Christ would do. Verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He offered himself without spot to God. He was the Lamb of God. No spot, no blemish, perfect. Your conscience can be clean from your sins. Is your conscience clean from your sins? I mean, we all have a conscience of sin. We look at the things that we've done and we, we mourn over them, we repent of them. But then our conscience can be clean from those things. 15 says, And th for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, his death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, how do the sins of the Old Testament get forgiven for believers? By the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what verse 15 says. They which are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. <clears throat> so what John is saying in John chapter 1 <clears throat> and um, verse 17, For the law was given by Moses, had its tabernacle, had its temple, had its bloody sacrifices. They never really worked. <clears throat> they were only a picture of what Jesus would do. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He purchased our redemption. His redemption is complete. His redemption is final. There is no more high priest. There are no more bloody sacrifices. There are no more men who are priests on earth interceding between you and God. Jesus is that mediator. He mediates the new covenant. Well, I hope this has been beneficial for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you've done for us in Christ Jesus, <clears throat> that in him is our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption, that he is the mediator of the new covenant, better than the old covenant. There's nothing wrong with the law, but Jesus Christ brings grace and truth and actual forgiveness of sins. And we ask for each soul that's here, Lord, hearing this message that they would repent of their sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would grant them eternal life, you would bring them into your kingdom, and that they would have the fullness that's in Christ Jesus. Grace upon grace in their lives, in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. In the next lesson, lesson nine, we'll begin uh, with chapter one and verse 18. I hope the Lord blesses you as you study his word. Here's the description of the free title that we're offering with this next lesson, or with this lesson. It's title number 37, and it's Baptism and Salvation. What baptism actually does is an extremely important question, especially what part baptism plays in salvation. 
Denominations are built upon erroneous understandings of this topic. <clears throat> In this study, we'll discuss if water baptism is necessary for salvation. Does it save? Does it wash away sins? Does it contribute in any way to the new birth? How is a person saved from sins? Are there works that we can do which add to the salvation accomplished by Christ on the cross? Again, this is title number 37, Baptism and Salvation. You can get a copy of that. Or you, if you have questions or comments about this lesson, please email me at BibleStudyVbyV at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more Bible study verse by verse.